Hey, everybody, it's Robert F. Kennedy Jr., and I'm uh, signing in from <clears throat> from Savannah, Georgia, overlooking the Ships Canal here, uh, and I want to welcome you all I'm, uh, to our to our first of uh, what we hope will be many inside the campaign, what we'll call the campaign kitchen, uh, um, Twitter spaces. And I have with me today my daughter-in-law, Emerilis Fox Kennedy, who is the new campaign director, and Charles Eisenstein, who is the campaign policy director. And we're going to do this in the future with a lot of the other higher level officials on the campaign. Um, but we've had a very, very exciting week. We've had two polls coming out this week, uh, the Quinnipiac poll yesterday, and, and three days earlier, the Harvard-Harris poll, which is both, both of them gold standard polls, Harvard-Harris and Mark Penn's polling firm. Uh, that have both had us at an astonishing 22% in the polls. This is 12, 12 months out from the election, over 12 months out from the election, and uh, with a lot of momentum, and with us now, me, enjoying the highest favorability rates of any candidate and actually any other person they polled. Oh, we're excited about that. We're excited what's happening in the campaign and outside, and we want to we want to welcome you all to join us and to pepper us with your questions. I'm going to turn it over to Amaryllis first. I also. Um, and and Stephanie Spear is the uh, is, is the campaign communications director, my press secretary. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Amaryllis. And uh, as many of you know, Amaryllis began her career as a uh, as a CIA undercover agent in the Middle East and in Asia in the weapons of mass destruction program. And a lot of people over the past couple of weeks have expressed the, uh, the the worry that once you're a CIA agent, it's like the mafia, that you're a CIA agent forever, and that you share the ideologies and the objectives and the agenda of the agency. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'll start out. I haven't told Amaryllis that I'm going to ask her this question, and anybody who really wants to know in depth about her career can read her amazing book, which the CIA tried to prevent her from publishing. Uh, but Amaryllis, uh, uh, tell us the truth. Are you still secretly a CIA agent? That's true. Bobby did not tell me he was going to ask me that, but I, I'm glad you did, Bobby. Look, I completely understand why a country that has not had a trustworthy president and a trustworthy uh, military and security services, uh, in terms of the the way that uh, the way that politics and public life have been conducted in this country for fifty plus years, um, would ask that question. I would ask it too. And uh, what I what I will say is that since leaving fifteen years ago, the north star of my life has been calling out and calling for reform of the egregious abuses of the intelligence community and the corporate captured military industrial complex overseas um, and within our own domestic life. I think they are a moral stain on our country. And I think that those of us as veterans of the intelligence community and the, and the, um, military industrial complex that come out and been the most forceful as activists for that change are are in many ways best poised 
to look at all of the revelations that are emerging in the press and put them in the context of understanding how these structures work, where the power balances lie, how uh, the secrets are hidden, how the black budgets are dealt with, and to make sure that when we when we bring this historic change in 2024 about and um, elect a leader for the first time in the last 50 plus years that has not only the, the commitment and passion and dedication to reform these abuses, but also the experience and the knowledge, I mean, encyclopedic knowledge of what needs to be done. That's really what drew, drew me to Bobby and to this campaign to begin with. You know, I, funnily enough, the, the uh, documentary that I was working on that I had to put on hold in order to, to uh, take this role with the campaign was a documentary um, with uh, the Showtime folks who do the circus and other things about um, proving the tie of the CIA and the intelligence community to the assassinations of, of the 60s um, and, and beyond. You know, these abuses, there is a there is a kind of widely held belief um, in in the at least the sort of center of the country that after the Church Commission, a lot of these abuses ended. Um, and we just see from looking around us right now in public life that that's just plainly not true. The intelligence community is deeply involved with censorship in this country. They're deeply involved with the the entrenched corporate interests are driving our military agenda overseas. Um, they're deeply entrenched with the seeding of political divisions and, and fear narratives, the discrediting of so-called conspiracy theories that, you know, <laughs> this is the saying, today's conspiracy theory is tomorrow's Pulitzer, uh, has never held more in our, in our society. And in fact, the coining of the term conspiracy theory was done by the intelligence community for that purpose of gaslighting and discrediting. So to me, the, the, the cure for um, suspicion of government is to elect a trustworthy government and a trustworthy leader. And I hear people complaining about the rise of conspiracy culture in the mainstream media. My answer is that if a government wants to be trusted, it needs to prove that it's trustworthy. And it has been many, many decades since our government has proven that to us. And, you know, every time we reach a milestone in this campaign's journey, all of the sort of received political wisdom and and the cynical political elites and mainstream media that make all of these pronouncements about what is possible and what's not possible, all of that falls away when there is a leader who tells you and when you call out the corporate capture of our government and the military imperialism and ask people, you know, do you want your money and your children's lives being sent to fight foreign wars? Or do you want it reinvested in our own country and our own communities and jobs and schools and hospitals so that we can actually ensure that every person who works hard in this country can afford a good life? And you know, Bob, Bobby, you and I first connected over our commitment to ending, you know, what have now become called the forever wars, which in their own way, I think is, is a title that is, you know, to suggest that this should just be normalized um, and, and reforming, maybe even dismantling the parts of the intelligence community, the, the security services who have really, when you look at it, turned the, the very people who paid their bills and the people and the, the constitution that they are supposed to be serving and turned on them, um, become this kind of turnkey totalitarianism that Ed Snowden, whose pardon I have been advocating for uh, for over a decade publicly, you know, he coined this term of turnkey totalitarianism and, and Bobby has spoken very publicly about it as well. The ability at, at any moment to escalate the the surveillance and and control and fear narratives to the point of, um, you know, passing whatever next emergency measure needs to happen. And I think we all know, having lived through 9/11 and its aftermath, and through the pandemic aftermath, 
that no quote unquote emergency power that the government has ever taken is ever returned when that emergency is over. You know, the the Patriot Act just quietly gets renewed every time it is about to expire without any unfair whatsoever. And that will continue with the future such security services. So, you know, Bobby and I have spent a lot of time um, prior to this campaign investigating all of the ways that unchecked corporate cronies have have been involved in the intelligence community and have controlled by agencies and, and um, military actions, implementing of coups um, and and vast state-sponsored violence. You know, you look at BP and the Mossadegh overthrow, United Fruit in Latin America, and then right up to today, you've got hedge funds and energy that have driven the last 20 years of conflict, the destruction of the Nord Stream pipeline, the, the gas pipelines all through Syria and the Middle East that are driving strategic decisions there. Um, and, and these so-called forever wars cost us eight trillion dollars and killed 900,000 people, um, according to Brown University. But they made defense hedge funds very rich, right? While they impoverished uh, the American middle class, our take home pay is down, housing prices are through the roof. Nobody can afford childcare. I mean, I am one of those. I have two kids under the age of five. And for anyone else out there who has two kids under the age of five in all 50 states for childcare than you do for housing. Healthcare, we all know, is in a, in a state of absolute financialization by hedge funds and completely unaffordable. People can't put gas in their car. And the truth is that the, the, the two-party system will never allow for an end to that kind of devastation of the middle class because they're in on it. Right. They've already been bought and they already owe favors. And when you look at both Biden and Trump's senior opponents, they are stacked with corporate cronies. And so the inflation continues and the war machine grinds on. Um, and, you know, I, 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 people look at all this and they understand in their bones that you know, the the leaders who have built their power for decades on these corporate relationships can never and will never return that wealth to the people. And so when you talk about the poll number, that is the, the understanding in the American uh, electorate that's driving those staggering poll numbers that we're seeing. You know, Bobby is, is not only polling at 22% nationwide, but he is leading among independent voters nationwide at a time when half of Americans describe themselves as independents. Um, you know, and these are people who who have had it with the two-party system, you know, telling us we have to hate one another while, while they use the distraction up and send our national wealth to to bankers and and bomb makers. And the other point from those polls important to 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 note is that Bobby is now also leading nationwide among voters who are under the age of 34. And that is such a crucial indicator of what is to come. Because when you look back at our history and you look at at young people's positions, they have always been, you know, the the bellwether, right, for social change in this country. Like you look at Vietnam, uh, you look at civil rights, opposition to the war in Iraq, like the, the young voters always get it right first. And so when I see these numbers 12 months out from the election, um, you know, I, I see a campaign that is poised to win the White House in 2024. And, uh, and I think one thing that I've noticed on Twitter that I would just like to clarify here so that people are aware of it is we've had so few viable three-way races in this country that people necessarily realize that uh, with the exception of Maine and Nebraska, these are winner-takes-all states. Every other state is a winner-takes-all state, meaning that in a, you know, in a three-way dead heat, it's 34% to win. And Bobby is already polling at 38% of independents and young voters with 22% across the board, 12 months out from the election. So to me, those are the numbers of, you know, a campaign that is on its way to winning a historic victory for an independent, honest, accountable government 
um, in 2024. But I, I know I've talked too long, um, but I will say that this movement cannot win, even if we are at 80 percent, if Bobby's name is kept off the ballot. And this is an age old tactic to suppress independence in, in our two party tyranny. But we will overcome it. And we have the plan underway and, and first signatures already being collected this week. But I want to give you guys an update on that. And I will continue to give you an update at the top of every week's campaign kitchen. Um, so we are undertaking a 50 state, all volunteer grassroots operation to gather signatures across this country. This is not pay to play. There is an incredibly complex um, kind of CD industry of I'll pay you nine dollars for a signature and then someone comes along and pays you ten dollars to screw it up on behalf of an opponent. We are doing this the the true tried and true pure volunteer methodology and we have a vast grassroots movement that have signed up to go through the training in all states and to be out circulating, uh, jumping up and down on overpasses saying pull off to sign for um, out in front of Trader Joe's, knocking doors in their neighborhood, um, and at the meet and greets where Bobby is getting record crowds, um, giving all of those people also this opportunity to sign a new Declaration of Independence and put Bobby's name on the ballot. So if you're interested in that, please come to Kennedy24.com, sign up, trained. We are really running a tight ship on this. There are very detailed requirements that are different in every single state. And we want to make sure that every petition signature that you gather counts. So we need to arm you with all of that detailed knowledge in advance. Um, currently, the states that are open do not require electors and do not require a vice presidential candidate to have been announced are listed on the site, but you can sign up for any of other states and we will let you know as soon as your turn to uh, to get that training is underway. Um, so please come volunteer your time. If you can't volunteer your time, I know economic this e is incredibly difficult, but please try to make a donation of any small amount. I don't think of them as donations. I think of it as an investment in an economy starting next year that will actually prioritize putting money back in your pocket and not sending it overseas. But this is an extremely expensive effort, and it is designed that way to keep choice off the ballot. If you can give of your time or of your, of your money, it will allow us to get Bobby's name on the ballot and make sure that these staggering poll numbers translate into um, a, a sweeping win at the ballot box next November 5th. Um, all right, so that's that's it for my updates. I, I, <laughs> let me, I, I want to go to Charles, but let me give myself, let me, let me say a couple of little responses, <clears throat> beginning with a plug from my new book, which is the Wuhan cover-up, which uh, is, explores the, uh, you know, the genesis, the ideology of how uh, the U.S. funded the development of COVID-19 uh, virus that caught SARS-CoV-2, transferred the technology and then funded the development in Wuhan, uh, but also the pervasive involvement in gain-of-function study from its inception of the CIA and the uh, and the Pentagon. The CIA's first mission when it was created in 1947 was Operation Paperclip, which was a operation to transfer German bioweapons and missile scientists and chemical weapons scientists from out from under the nose and the hands and the handcuffs of the Nuremberg prosecutors, because most of them were war criminals, many of them faced the death penalty from both Germany and Japan to Fort Detrick, where they set up the, the this extraordinary bioweapons program which by 1969 had achieved nuclear equivalent, meaning that they could kill everybody in the United States for 29 cents per body, which is what they pose, boasted about. And I trace the CIA's history in this, and the, um, you know, the CIA was the biggest funder through USAID of bioweapons research in Wuhan. 
oh, these are uh, the links between our military, our intelligence agency, and NIH in creating the bug are things that people should, that every American needs to understand. Uh, I'll say one other thing, which is that, you know, Amaryllis often tells me there's 20,000 people who work for CIA. And 90% of them are patriots. They're good public servants. They're idealists like she was who joined the agency to protect our national security because they love our country. Uh, but many of the top officials, the branch heads, the division heads, are people who have risen through the ranks precisely because of their willingness and capacity to serve the military industrial complex and the big military contractors and the, uh, the, the more, uh, I would say, seditious uh, aspirations of some of the people who run that agency, that, which has become a government within the government. Um, Mike Pompeo, who I never really liked, I, I would say I actively probably disliked him because of his involvement in so many nefarious activities and his militaristic approach to, uh, uh, to running the CIA and later running the State Department. Um, I met him for the first time a couple of months ago in Las Vegas and had not a very odd dinner with him. But during that dinner, he said to me the one biggest regret of his life was not having reformed the CIA when he was running the agency between 2017 and 2019. He said he had an opportunity to do it, but he never did it. He never took that opportunity, never exercised that opportunity. And then he turned to me and he said, the entire upper echelon of that agency is made up of people who do not believe in the democratic institutions in our country. And I was really dumbstruck um, by that statement from a man who I had long characterized as being right at the center of that, of the military industrial complex. Well, that was very, very eye opening. And, uh, you know, it's something that, uh, you know, I know what my, my dad's plans were for reforming the agency. I know what President Kennedy, my uncle's plans were, and I know what I'm going to do to make sure that the agency honors the aspirations of that 90% of its employees who are trying to help our country rather than that. 10% who are, uh, who are selling us out to the military-industrial complex and the military-industrial complex and engaging us in these permanent forever wars. I want to now introduce uh, our uh, policy director at the campaign, Charles Eisenstein. And Charles, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you to begin just because we're kind of introducing ourselves. This is the first episode of Campaign Kitchen, and we're trying to we're introducing ourselves to our audience. And in this, you know, as I said, in the spirit of transparency, uh, which you won't see in other campaigns, I don't think. And I why don't you why don't you tell the audience how you came to to work the strange story of how you came to work for this campaign. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very interesting conversation so far. Um, yeah. Bobby, can you mute your mic? Cause it's getting some interference here. Um, yeah. It was, it, you know, I'm basically, or was a countercultural philosopher of sorts, uh, writer, public speaker. And one of my followers uh, on Substack won this raffle to uh, go falconing with with Bobby Kennedy, so she invited me. I'd never even met her before, and she only bought one raffle ticket. You know, and they have thousands and thousands every time for this fundraiser. So I show up at this event, and we're sitting around the lunch table. There's maybe 15, 20 people, and somebody's talking about something, and and I'm just you know I'm just kind of sitting there, and and Bobby turns to me and is like, "Well, what do you think about that, Charles?" and I think it had something to do with, it was like some kind of uh, COVID issue, you know, where I, I made some comment about, you know, even if you're proven right a year later, the, the stink of disrepute lingers on and, and, you know, you're never rehabilitated. 
And I think it was something like that. And so Bobby and I started talking, you know, and next thing you know, we're texting. And then he invites me to his, his kind of, uh, initial campaign meeting to, to, to plan the campaign. And one thing after another, I just end up beyond all expectation. I mean, I had never imagined that I would be involved in mainstream politics because like I've been kind of outside, you know, um, writing from a very, very different place. Uh, but it was very heartening for me because I had kind of given up on change ever happening from within the political system. And it awakened a hope in me. And that hope is what has carried me through the ups and downs of the campaign. Um, you know, because this is, and as you'll see, I think, um, in these campaign kitchen episodes, we're not all unified uh, in our beliefs um, on policy, on strategy. Uh, Bobby and I have significant differences on a lot of issues, you know, but this isn't about, oh, I'm going to wait around for the perfect candidate uh, who I agree with on everything. <laughs> you know, if you're waiting for that, you're going to be waiting an awful long time. And related to that, um, you know, when this thing came up about, whoa, well, Amaryllis, she worked for the CIA, so she must be one of the bad guys. Like this mindset of of figuring out who are the good guys and who are the bad guys and who can I never be associated with because they did something in their past or said something in their past 20, 30 years ago. You know, like like now there's like this video that the Trump people are putting out about how Bobby supported Hillary Clinton. Okay, that in, in whatever, 20, 2004, when she was running for Congress for the Senate. Okay, well, that puts him into the ranks of the untouchables now. And I can't be associated with him. Like that whole way of thinking is identical to the uh, intense partisanship that is destroying our country. And we have to grow up and stop seeing the world in black and white binary terms and understand that people are complicated. Institutions are complicated. The CIA is not monolithic. There are horrible people in it. There are good people in it. The, the good people probably feel very frustrated and and constrained by the system that they're in and by the leadership. And so it's not like we're going to war against the agencies, the FDA and the and the FBI and the CDC and all of these agencies. Uh, it's it's and we're not writing anybody off because of what they said or did under different circumstances. And so this is what I would call maturity. And I believe that this campaign can be part of a, a coming to maturity of our political system. You know, we're not in this just to win an election, but we're in it to change American politics. So, and, and that is why, or one of the reasons why uh, we're running as independent to step out of this us versus them thinking that has paralyzed this country. I mean, just look at what Congress is doing now. Uh, every few months now, uh, deadlocked in this uh, debt ceiling debate or government shutdown debate, you know, these they can barely even do their jobs. And I think this is, you know, part of the explanation for these poll numbers that we're seeing when, you know, 12 months out, I mean, people don't even really know Bobby very well. Um, and the more we've experienced, like the more that they actually hear him in his own words and not just listening to what the mainstream media portrays him as, the more they understand that um, something, that there is a sea change that is possible in American politics now. So yeah, that's just a little bit of my um, my perspective on it. And I'll turn it back over to uh, um, if any, Bobby or Emerald, if you have anything to add to that, or maybe we want to invite some questions from the listeners. Yeah, well, let me. Let me just as you as you um, provide your next comment. If anyone's interested in asking a question, please at request to be a speaker, and we'll soon be calling on you. Yeah, and that was the voice of Stephanie Spear. I, I want to uh, take this opportunity <coughs> to correct a, um, a tweet that we put up yesterday. We were 
called, Stephanie was called and asked, you know, and I'm on the road, so I'm speaking to her remotely, and a lot of times I'll talk to her, and then she'll put up a tweet. Uh, we were asked about a 1993 entry from, uh, from Jeffrey Epstein's flight logs that showed me uh, on his plane, and my wife, Mary, and two of my kids, Mary was actually pregnant at that time with, my, with Connor, my third child, um, that happened over Easter in 1993. And I, I answered her that, that, yeah, my wife, Mary, had known Glenn Maxwell a little bit, and had uh, and Glenn found out this was, you know, uh, uh, Jeffrey Epstein's girlfriend. He found out that we wanted that we were going to go to Palm Beach to visit my mom, mother who lived there over the Easter holiday, and she offered us a ride. So I rode on that. You know, I, I went on that flight. Of course, this is a time when nobody knew anything about F. Epstein and his shenanigans. I don't know if they they even begun. This was 30, uh, 30 years ago. I don't even know if he'd begun all of his his uh, saga at that point. I'm sure he was involved in something bad. Um, but uh, there was actually, there, there is an, another episode. It's the way that the tweet went, that Stephanie wrote the tweet, that was the only time I was on Jeffrey Epstein's plane. But actually, there was another time, around the same time, I think it was a couple of months later, and I went again with my wife, Mary, and my two older kids on his plane to uh, Deadwood, South Dakota, to, to spend the day fossil hunting, to take the kids to Mount Rushmore and to um, Sitting Bull Memorial and then go to... Um, and then go fossil hunting for a day. So we rode out there with them and again rode back. And that was the, uh, I was pretty, that was the only time that I'd been on that plane. And of course, I never knew anything about what Je Jeffrey Epstein never. these things the same as everybody else did by reading them in the newspapers. Incidentally, people who lived in New York at that time and who were operating at a level where, you know, like where I was, raising money for charities, for the water keepers and for Hudson River Keeper, I ran into a lot of people whose lives uh, have since turned out uh, to have a lot of of very, very bad and disturbing secrets. I knew uh, O.J. Simpson very well. I knew uh, Bill Cosby very, very well. I knew Harvey Weinstein. I knew Roger Ailes uh, and many, many others. So, but, you know, you run into people in New York um, and, uh, you know, you don't, you have no idea, no way of knowing until it's revealed in the newspapers or by indictments that they are that they have a deep secret or darker life. Oh, I just wanted to make sure that that was out there. Um, and I, I don't think it's something anybody would ever find out about it because it's not on any flight log. But I want to be as as forthright and honest as possible. And in fact, I've discussed I don't know about a year ago. I discussed that episode, my whole relationship, my whole knowledge which uh, uh, of Jeffrey Epstein with Whitney Webb, with an um, investigative reporter who was doing a story on him. Uh, so that's it. I just wanted to get that on the table. And then, yeah, let's uh, open it up for questions. Great. If anyone has a question, they can raise their hand or request to speak. So I'm looking to see if anyone has raised their hand. Uh, I see a lot of hands raised. Okay. So do you... Um, 
because that's only showing on your phone. Uh, okay, um, well, should I? Do you want it? Yep. Yeah, let me let me pick somebody. Melissa O'Neill. And Stephanie, what do I do? Oh, add a speaker. Okay. Okay, Melissa, you can speak. Evening, Robert. Thank you so much for um, letting me speak. It's an absolute honor. Um, I'm here in the southeast of Ireland and have been following your work with um, HPV HPV vaccine on trial uh, since 2016. So we have helped a lot of people in Ireland that have been affected by the, the vaccines and we have fought very hard, a small circle of us here in Ireland. I know you know Eileen, that was the author of HPV Vaccine on Trial. And um, your own great-grandmother is actually from my hometown, Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy. And so very honoured to speak with you in person and you have all our support. I'm an advocate of the Children's Health Defence here for many years in Ireland. We've got many attacks <laughs> for supporting your work, as you can imagine. In And um, basically, my question to you is, with the large um, number of Irish Americans would coming to Ireland as part of your campaign, would you consider this? I have wrote you personally on this as well, and that you would get a very, very Irish warm welcome, um, you know, here both um, in my hometown and in Wexford, where your family, re you know, used to reside. And um, just honoured to support you in any way we can online um, in your campaign. We speak on many platforms from Ireland, um, all over America. And um, I've brought your name up as to what people thought of yourself. And I have to say, it's been a very, very positive response that I'm delighted of. Um, and, you know, I really do think you can do this. So from Ireland and hope you will visit as part of your campaign. Um, it would be amazing for that Irish American vote that we would definitely um, be supporting your way. Well, thank you so much, Melissa. But tell me what town you're from. Um, Brough County Limerick, Robert. Um, Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy. Um, we have... Um, the Thomas Fitzgerald Kennedy Museum of your whole family. We have John F. Kennedy Monument right in front of my mum and dad's house. So, Brough County Limerick, and um, we've had Caroline visit, um, and we've had a number of the. And I was part of, um, and I'm actually standing in elections here in Ireland as well um, as an independent. <laughs> so, I um, was delighted when you did go independent personally, and you know that we can give you the so full of our support. Um, through the Irish well, thank, in in America. Thank you very much, Melissa. I'm, I'm embarrassed that I've never been uh, been there. I've been to my the Kennedy family ancestral home, which is really just a little um, thatch roofed uh, hut. When I first visited there in um, in New Ross in Wexford County. Uh, but I have to go to Limerick the next time I'm in Ireland, and I look forward to meeting you. Yeah, we, we're representing several thousand girls who, and some boys who were injured by the Gardasil vaccine who have terrible autoimmune diseases. Many of them uh, have died, and, they're, and we're representing their families. Um, but uh, uh, a, a girl, the lead plaintiff, in our case, got the vaccine when she was 16 years old. She's been in a wheelchair now for 11 years. Uh, she is unable to walk. Uh, she gets seizures every couple of minutes. Uh, she has to sit in a darkened room. She can't watch TV because the light triggers seizures. And, you know, she was a bat. She was a volleyball star. It was top in her class. She had a golden road in front of her, and um, and her life was really uh, was really derailed uh, by this this inoculation, uh, which pretends to be able to avoid uh, cervical cancer. And typically, 
<clears throat> cervical cancer is diagnosed at the age of 58. So they're giving girls this shot when they're nine years old and for something that's supposedly they're going to avoid 50 years later. And there's very, very little evidence that it works and that it might work to actually uh, accelerate cancers. But it definitely causes autoimmune diseases. And, uh, and we are suing Merck. People may say, well, you can't sue under the Vaccine Act. And, the, uh, and that's true. You can't sue for product liability, but you can sue for fraud. And in this case, Merck committed fraud in order to get approval of this shot. So we're representing people all over the world, all over America. And there are tens of thousands of been injured. So thank you for signing in and thank you for your support, Melissa. And now we'll go to a question from Ed, who is in the regenerative farming community. Ed? Okay, Ed, can you can you speak? I'm adding you as a speaker right now. You should have ability to speak. There you go. Yep, we can. Ah, oh, great, great to talk to you, Robert. Thank you so much in early August for doing the roundtable with the regenerative agriculture farmers. That was a great event, and I know you mentioned during that. Uh, maybe a doing a future one because we could get more into the solutions that regenerative agriculture really has. And because that's a huge growing movement. And the great thing about it, it's grassroots. Regenerative ag was created by farmers and some great in, more independent researchers that found they were doing some really good work. And it's spreading tremendously. We're learning so much about how nature grows food how important the soil is and how much potential it has. And what I find that's really good about it too is across the political spectrum, people are really learning that good nutrient dense, healthy food is really important. And I think we learned that, especially during the pandemic. And I think it's something that really brings people together across the spectrum. And I'm hoping we can promote it more um, during your campaign because um, you're not tied to the big input industries that are trying to greenwash regenerative now. So thank you very much um, for your work in this and giving me a chance to speak. I mean, uh, regenerative agriculture is important not only for our soils, for people who um, who believe, uh, you know, who are frightened of climate change, the best sink for carbon are healthy soils with good microbiomes in them. Uh, and uh, it also gives us back real food in this country today. A carrot, a typical carrot has fewer nutrients than eight carrots had two decades ago. So we're giving our kids foods that are, are laced with poison that and that poison destroys the soil that are devoid of nutrients and we're making our country sicker and sicker. Ultimately, food is medicine if we want to end the chronic disease epidemic. We got to start making that, uh, making sure that we give our children food that actually makes them healthy. And, you know, I've been on farms in uh, in in Kansas, in Iowa, where the farmers cannot drink their own water because they're so saturated. They're addicted to uh, carbon-based fertilizers and to poison-based pesticides, and uh, and their, their water is no longer palatable. And those farmers are part of the dispossessed in this country. They're not farming in the way that they want. They're not making as good food they're doing. Uh, 
you know, they're 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 basically mass producing commodities that have very very real world value. A fill your stomach, but they don't make you a healthy person. And we need to go back and incentivize farmers to do what they want to do with their lives, which is to produce good, healthy, wholesome food and and uh, dignified, healthy communities. And uh, yeah, that will be one of the primary drivers of my presidency. And I promise you, we will do another uh, convocation on regenerative agriculture to talk about the solutions. It's a great idea. I'm just going to add something, Charles, here, uh, that, that this issue is, is a good example of the kind of issues that we're going to be running on and implementing in the administration you know, like no one, uh, no one in a in a debate or a uh, an interview on the mainstream media is going to say, uh, "What's your position on regenerative agriculture?" It's just not even on the radar screen. They'll ask you about guns. They'll ask you about abortion. They'll ask you about Ukraine. They'll ask you about everything on the existing policy menu that is already highly polarized. But there's a vast area, a vast domain of of policies that. Uh, make so much sense that aren't politicized left and right, and that actually transcend those polarities. Like you could be a climate change activist, you could be a tri- climate change skeptic, but and both of you are going to say, "Wow, regenerating soil, regenerating the water table, getting poisons out of our food." I mean, this sounds good to everybody. So this is one of the unifying issues that we want to bring um, into greater prominence in, in the campaign. Yes, Charles, exactly. Um, we're now going to bring Sherry to speak. Sherry, I just invited you as a speaker. Let me. Okay, we're going to try Karen. Okay, we're going to move on. to Holden. Let's see if this will work for you, Holden. It's connecting. Okay, Holden. You can speak now. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, Thank you so much for having me up here. Can you guys all hear me? Yes. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, kind of a coalition, um, if you guys were thinking about that. So I'm 22 years old. Um, I'm a college student. I am thrilled to see Bobby's campaign. You know, I feel like I am hearing about the the America that, you know, my parents and grandparents were so proud of, but that I never knew um, growing up, you know, under the forever wars with uh, this incredible rate of chronic disease all around me. I feel like I hear from Bobby the that America that people were so proud of um, in past generations. And I'm really excited about this independent, um, another declaration of independence, you know, that idea of declaring our independence from the two-party system. So I wanted to ask if there was um, any plans of kind of working in a coalition in 2024, you know, down ballot with uh, independence or, you know, even other minor parties at the local and state level to kind of build a, a broader movement um, out of this campaign. I, you know, there was a, there was a, uh, a poll that came out, uh, let's see, about almost a month ago that uh, that talked about young people, and it said that 
in 2013, 85% of young Americans between 18 and 34 years old said that they were proud of the United States of America. And Holden, in the same poll taken a month ago, said that only 17% were proud to America, so to be American. So sometime in the past, in the administration of the last two presidents, um, the, the young people of this country have become utterly devoid of, of pride in our country and hope for their own futures. And one of the things that I want to do with this campaign is to give them back those things, to make them feel like the American dream applies to them, that they can get a job, they can finance a home, they can raise a family, they can take a summer vacation, they can put something aside for their retirement, and that we can work together to build a nation as the moral standing, the moral authority that we once had in the world and as the affection of the world uh, rather than looked upon as, uh, you know, everybody in the world wants our leadership. No one wants our bully. And our political leaders seem to have forgotten that lesson. And, yeah, we are partnering with um, with this met, with anybody who will partner with us. So we're partnering with a, We have very, very close ties to our friends on the state level, national level, and the Libertarian Party, who share so many of my values. Um, we are uh, we're working with other little political parties across the states, and we're working with coalitions of all kinds of people, of professionals, of labor unions, and, uh, and other organizations as well. So thank you very much for that question. Uh, Charles or Emeralis, do you have anything to add? Uh, well, I will jump in to to say uh, that I really admire the way that you you explained never having experienced the what what our own Charles Eisenstein describes as uh, the America that almost was and yet may be, um, which has been a guiding kind of north star for us in this in this campaign, and. When I look, for example, at my youngest brother-in-law, Aiden, you know, do, doesn't remember 9-11, has never known a country in America that was not at war, has never remembered a time where people in this country could, uh, could work hard and afford their bills, um, doesn't remember a time where the media wasn't constantly telling us to hate our neighbors and fear our friends. Um, and it doesn't have to be this way. And young people know that in their bones. They know that the two-party system that got us here is not the path out of it. And we are building across this country a coalition of the people. And that transcends so many of the, the kind of traditional uh, clusters or loyalties that the media and the two-party system have trained us to are, are dyed in wool and, and forever. Uh, you, you must either agree with these 20 opinions or those 20 opinions. And if you divert from one stance, the party kicks you out and you're shamed on social media and you're out of the club. You know, each of us is such a, a unique intellectual and spiritual footprint and or fingerprint and um and each of us believes the things that we do because of every single day and hour of our life that have given us so many unique experiences and it's the collective unique fingerprints that i think that makes america such an extraordinary intellectual public square um and beacon of freedom and if we try to cram all of them into two I identical boxes and make them hate one another we end up with the kind of of mental health crisis and spiritual bankruptcy, moral bankruptcy, and yes, financial bankruptcy that that we're facing as a country right now. And so, as we build this coalition, it will be with open arms to to those who have previously felt that they had to be on opposite sides of so many issues. Um, you know that 
we're a lot closer than we think in so many ways um, at this moment when the the crush of potential tyranny is upon us and this is our moment in history. Young people are going to be at the absolute forefront of this movement. We have um, nationwide volunteer Zooms every um, Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern um, and Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern. If you join you will be able to plug in to your um, campus lead if you're a young person that is at school um, or to your local state or regional lead uh, and, and begin to build that coalition from the grassroots up. And of course, that will incorporate, you know, local and, and state and, and national races, but it will also incorporate each and every one of you. You don't have to be running for office to be a part of this coalition. This is about bringing together Americans who've forgotten how to even talk to one another and realizing that when we do, we have the power to take back our country. And that the reason that all of this division has been sown to begin with is to to stop us from having those conversations and prevent realizing that when we link arms and work through our differences and tolerate differences of opinion, we can team up to take back our country. So please, as a young person, as an old person, any of you come join those Zooms, get plugged into your state and local and campus and, and other um, uh, organization structures on the ground so that you can help with ballot access, with voter registration, with making sure that people who've never been involved in the process before, who've checked out and never believed that it was worth fighting for, are uh, that little kin kindle, that little ember of hope is rekindled in them, and they um, they they light up and become a part of this movement to to change our country, to elect Bobby president, and make a a, a lasting change in this country. Get corporate capture out of government and our military imperialism overseas, and um, bring our wealth home so that young people like you actually have a future that you can be proud of and a country that you can be proud of. Um, hey, uh, Amaryllis, how do they, how do they sign up for the zoom? Uh, if you come to Kennedy 24 and you go to the volunteer section or the take action section, um, the zoom links are there. They're open. You don't need to register. You can come to the same links every week. And um, we can't wait to connect with you. We'll get you in touch with your, your state and local leads and get you off to the races. And Charles, do you have any, Charles, do you have anything to add? Uh, I could add, but I think I'm just going to respect everybody's time. And, um, and so, no, <laughs> not right now. Great. Well, that's the close of our space for today, but we are going to do the weekly. The times and days may change a little bit, but please stay tuned to at Robert Kennedy Jr.'s Twitter account, and uh, we will be posting all the upcoming Twitter spaces there. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. We look forward to the next one.